Hi everyone, uh, I'm Leo Zhadovsky. I'm a Principal Solutions Architect at Amazon Web Services, and I'm gonna talk to you today about building highly available and scalable web applications on AWS. So AWS has developed a broad collection of services, uh, or the broadest collection of services available from any cloud provider. Our approach to regions, availability zones, POPs, provides global coverage for high availability and low latency applications. And as you can see here, uh, we've got foundation services across compute storage, security, and networking. And these services offer customers flexibility in their architecture. Uh, we also offer the capability to have both managed and unmanaged databases. Uh, so you can, for example, host uh, MySQL or Postgres or Oracle or SQL Server on us, and you can either do that so where you're completely managing it, or you can use our managed service uh, RDS for that. Uh, we also have offerings for analytics and application services, uh, and we've got management tools that let you, you know, manage all these things and figure out how do you deploy them, how do you make sure they're secure, uh, so on and so forth. So specifically with websites, uh, we've got every type of web application that runs on AWS. So ranging from static websites, uh, so if you've got a blog or just static content, so you need to upload images or CSS or JavaScript, uh, or just a basic product page if you're launching something, uh, you can host that on AWS. Uh, then we can get into you know, more complicated uh, just website hosting. So if you're hosting WordPress or Drupal uh, or any kind of you know, PHP or Ruby or Node.js based application uh, or a content management system, can host that on us. And you know, going to more complicated uh, architectures, you can host a fully dynamic web application on us. So we've got customers such as PBS, Unilever, and Vodafone, and they have highly interactive websites on us, web applications, online services, and social and sharing sites as well. So specifically, let's talk about uh, three use cases here for how our customers are using AWS for web applications. So first, uh, let's talk a little bit about Pinterest. So Pinterest has scaled over the years to become one of the most popular social networks globally. Uh, I'm sure most of you have been to Pinterest, but it's a social media website that enables millions of customers to share their images of their interests um, on electronic pin boards. And so the company also has a very small engineering team, uh, and they need a solution that will enable them to scale. And so AWS provided Pinterest with that solution. So they have over 400, 10 terabytes of data, 8 billion objects in S3, which is our object storage service, um, and it helped them meet their, their needs, uh, their demand for traffic. Let's take a look at Netflix. So everybody here, I'm sure, has used Netflix before. Uh, Netflix uses AWS to increase reliability and efficiency. So Netflix needed a reliable, scalable system that would not be prone to data corruption. So with AWS, um, they can qu quickly deploy thousands of servers and terabytes of storage when they need to within minutes, and then they can spin that capacity down when they don't need it anymore. Then there's Reddit. So sure, most of you have been to Reddit. Uh, Reddit needs to scale its new site to handle 4 billion page views per month, and they only have 20 employees. So originally, Reddit, uh, they were operated on physical servers. But when the site first started, uh, they, their number of users quadrupled in 18 months. And they realized they couldn't scale in an on-premises environment. So by migrating to AWS, Reddit can now scale uh, and manage 4 billion page views per month and run its website with only uh, 20 employees. So why use AWS for website hosting? So let's take a look first at traditional capacity planning and the challenges that that poses. So when you're running a website with a fixed set of capacity or on premise, right? So you've got your current server capacity and you've got your so you've got, you know, a set amount of page views and you you know what capacity you need to handle that many page views. And that demand grows over time. So you want to stay ahead of that you know, of the demand. So you're always going to have a little bit more capacity than what you actually need, right? So you, you're going to have some unused capacity. Then you keep adding capacity as your demand rises. Then you're going to have a period where no new capacity is planned, right? So you're just going to have the same amount of servers. And all through this time, you know, if, you're, if your demand goes down, if you have less users, now you've got a bunch of extra servers sitting there, which isn't good. So 
Now you've got a large promotion plan, so you add some more capacity, and your promotion goes a lot uh, better than you thought it was going to go, and now uh, you don't have enough capacity. Your, your actual usage exceeds expectations, and so now you've got poor experience. So your site is down, or it's very slow, and you don't want that. So these are some of the challenges that we see our customers have with capacity planning. Okay. So then your peak period is over, and you, your demand goes back down. Now you've got all these servers sitting there that you're not using. Well, with AWS, you can have capacity without planning, right? So your capacity always matches your demand. And the ways that this typically happens is you use a technology called auto-scaling. So auto-scaling uh, allows you to set uh, a minimum amount of capacity that you want for your web servers, for example. It also allows you to set a maximum amount of capacity so you don't exceed the you know, um, a set amount of cost that you want. And within that range, you can set triggers to scale up or scale down. So for example, if you start getting a lot of traffic, you can say, well, if my CPU usage across all my web servers is uh, really high, let's say it's over 85% for 10 minutes, just automatically launch more servers. And then when uh, you know, the usage goes down and your CPU usage is down, then just take some of the servers out and terminate them. So you scale up and down as you need to. And that's just an example in EC2, but you can do that in various ways across uh, different services of ours. So to give you an example of a customer who's done this, so Notre Dame University, um, they are able to scale up for a 500% increase on game days. So they have a really popular football team. Uh, whenever there's a football game, they have a huge bump in traffic. And Previously, their site just crashed all the time when it was on-premise, when they had game days. And so that wasn't good. And so they moved their website to AWS. Uh, they can now automatically scale to handle this 500% increase. And at the same time, it also cost them 40% less than their uh, previous on-premise install. So now you don't need traditional capacity planning. So you don't need to run facilities. You don't have to worry about running a data center, about stacking servers, uh, swapping hard drives all that undifferentiated heavy lifting you no longer have to worry about and you can worry about you know or, or focus on building your applications so building what your customers actually want and not all this undifferentiated heavy lifting you also have a lot of freedom here so we've got services at every layer so i'll talk about you know specifically uh, about a specific example in a little bit but you can uh, you can have the freedom to run what so software you want at the database tier, at the caching tier, at the web and app tier, and so on and so forth. You have complete control above the hardware. So you have, for example, in EC2, which is our virtual server service, you have root access to the instances, so you have full control over what goes on there. And we've got over 35 services that simplify and speed development. So you can either you know, use existing technology that's out there, or you can use one of our services to, as a building block to build your application. Uh, it's really easy to install, set up, and configure all this, and we have a lot of services that help you do that. Uh, and we've got a marketplace, too. So the AWS Marketplace allows you to uh, buy or get open source software from other vendors uh, in a really easily deployable format. So for example, uh, with Drupal, uh, there's a company called Bitnami, and they make these preset images. So if you don't want to you know, install Drupal from scratch, you can just use one of their images, and it's got Drupal pre-installed on it. In terms of our global infrastructure, uh, we've currently got 12 regions around the world. Uh, we've got three regular uh, regions in the US. Uh, we've got 33 availability zones and 54 edge locations. So let me explain kind of what this is, right? So each region you can think of as a separate set of cloud services. Uh, and within each region, there's at least two availability zones. So a region is defined by a ge geographic area, and an availability zone is essentially a, one or more data centers, and they're geographically close to each other, so they're set to have a low latency. Uh, they're also designed for uh, to be on different power, uh, different uh, networking feeds, and to be on different flood and fall planes where applicable. So basically, you can easily design your applications to go across availability zones, and this allows you to have highly available applications and to be able to survive both instance failure and availability zone failure if that happens. Our edge locations are basically our points of presence where we have our DNS and content delivery services. And so those services are more prone to latency and latency is more important there, so that's why we have more of them and they're closer to the users. Another reason that we have uh, customers using AWS for hosting websites is that it's low cost. So there's, by default, there's no upfront cost. You just pay for what you use. 
Uh, as you use more of our services, there's tiered pricing discounts, so there's volume discounts. Uh, there's no long-term contracts. You literally can put up a huge website, for, for example, for a promotion on AWS. You can host it on there for five days. You can then, when the promotion's over, just turn everything off, and you've only paid for five days now. Um, we also have different pricing models where if you're running things long term, you can save money. So that's called a reserved instance. And we have ways to bid on our excess capacity. And that's called a spot instance. And we have a history of steady price drops. So uh, at this point, we've had over uh, 40 price drops over the history of AWS. So speaking of cost optimization, um, Another good example of a customer who took advantage of this is the Obama campaign. And so I used to work at the Obama campaign before I worked at Amazon. Uh, I was a DevOps engineer there. And when I was there, we built uh, over 200 applications all on AWS. Uh, we didn't have the time or money to run a data center to build our own hardware, and we didn't need to with AWS. And uh, we were able to scale to the cap to capacity that we needed. And when you're running a presidential campaign, uh, you know, one day you might have no traffic on your website, then something happens in the news, and you have a huge spike in traffic. And we were able to handle those kind of spikes with AWS. Another advantage of AWS is that we have uh, a set of deployment and management services. So you know, once, once you have your servers and your databases, how do you actually deploy your code? How do you manage what you have running? So we've got services such as Elastic Beanstalk, uh, OpsWorks, and CloudFormation, which let you do that. We've also got content delivery services. So we have a content delivery network uh, called CloudFront. And this allows you to uh, run a website or do video streams and cache your website, and we'll, we'll talk about the advantages of that in a little bit. And another thing that we always uh, come across uh, that customers are rightfully uh, uh, concerned about is security, right? So you want your website to be secure. You want your applications to be secure. Uh, you want to make sure all your data is secure. So we allow you uh, to do all that, right? So we've got secured premises, secured storage, keys, communications, network access users' logins, and you have full control to add additional layers of security. Uh, we've also gone through several certifications, um, and such as SOC 1, you can host HIPAA data on us, so healthcare uh, data, and so on and so forth. So let's dive a little bit deeper into some of these. First of all, our secured premises. So AWS has world-class, highly secure data centers. We utilize state-of-the-art electronic surveillance and multi-factor access controls. So for example, our data centers, you know, uh, they don't have like big Amazon signs on them. I don't know where they are. If you don't have a business need to know, you don't know where they are. Uh, they're staffed 24-7 by uh, trained security guards, uh, and access is authorized on a least privileged basis. In terms of storage, so AWS supports protecting your data at rest. So it's up to you whether you want to encrypt your data or not. Uh, but whether it's through S3, which is our object storage service, or EBS, which is our block storage service, you have the option to easily encrypt your data at rest. It's literally just a checkbox when you, when you either upload the object or when you create your volume. So you can easily encrypt your data at rest if you want. And you can also encrypt it in transit. All of our APIs are uh, SSL and TLS enabled. Uh, when you communicate with your resources in AWS, so whether it's if it's a Windows uh, instance, for example, it's going to be over a remote desktop. If it's a Linux instance, it's going to be uh, over SSH. Uh, those are all encrypted protocols. So your your communication with your resources in AWS is going to be encrypted over the air, um, and all of our API endpoints, as I mentioned, are supported uh, support TLS and SSL. We also uh, provide full, a full range of network security. So for example, uh, you can restrict who accesses your resources by IP address, by user, by CIDR block. Um, and so you can do this through various ways in our VPC, which is our virtual private cloud. So we give you security groups. Uh, we give you network access control lists that you can take advantage of. Uh, if you're using S3, for example, which is our object storage service, uh, there's bucket policies and access control lists and identity access management. So you have a lot of control over who accesses your data at various different layers. Uh, we have a system called IM, which is Identity and Access Management. So when you have an AWS account, you don't just have like one login that everyone uses. So if, for example, if you have an AWS account for a company, you're going to want to have multiple users, multiple groups, multiple roles. And Identity and Access Management allows you to do that. 
Furthermore, when you have a login, you, there's always the risk of somebody stealing your password, right? Or somebody guessing your password or brute forcing their way in. Uh, so identity access management supports uh, two-factor authentication. So what that is, is you can either have a physical token or a soft token, for example, on your an app on your phone. And after you enter your actual password, you're going to have to enter a one-time key. And that one-time key is generated every minute. And so if, even if somebody gets your password, they won't be able to log in unless uh, they also have your phone or your hardware token. So th that's what multi-factor security is, and we support it. Lastly, you have full control over the software that you actually run. So as I, managed, or as I mentioned earlier, uh, you manage your resources on AWS. So you can choose which operating system you want. You can choose what types of encryption you want to use. You can choose what security applications and what user and access management tools you want to have. So whether you want to have a simple instance with just a basic SSH login, or you want to have something that's tied to an Active Directory and encrypted all the way throughout, um, you can do whatever meets your security needs. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, we, whether ranging from FIPS uh, endpoints to HIPAA compliance to FedRAMP, uh, all kinds of, uh, to PCI compliance, we are uh, certified with all kinds of different certifications, and that will help you build secure applications on top of us. So let's drill down to actual web application hosting. So for this example, I'm just using a basic WordPress install. So WordPress is a open source uh, content management system. It's really widely popular out there, but this architecture can be expanded to Drupal or any kind of content management system or any kind of basic web application. So if you're running one of these right now, what you're likely doing is you've got it running on your laptop or on a server somewhere, and so you've got one server, you've got your your web server on it, so it's Nginx or Apache, in, in probably in term, if you're running WordPress. Uh, you've got your database, which is probably MySQL or Postgres, uh, and that's all running on one instance or one box, right? And that's great for testing, but it, that's not scalable. So there's several drawbacks to that, right? It's a single point of failure, so that means that if your server fails, if the software fails, if there's any kind of failure at any layer of it, your application is down, right? It's not scalable without downtime. So if I start getting a lot of traffic, once I exceed the CPU and memory capacity of the server that I'm on or the instance that I'm on, I have to get a bigger server when I'm on-premise. Or if I'm not on-premise, if I'm on AWS, that means I have to resize it. So I'm going to have to shut it down. I'm going to have to resize it and start it back up. So that means there's some downtime involved, right? So that's not ideal. And all components are on the same instance. So that's not good from a security perspective. You want to separate your database and your app and web tier from each other. Right? They should only be talking to each other um, through you know, whatever ports they're meant to talk to each other through. Not, you should, they shouldn't have file level uh, system access to each other. And so it's not good that there's no separation of application from data. So we want to solve all these things. So how, how do we scale from here? Well, the first thing we want to do is let's break out uh, the WordPress installation into tiers. So what, what is involved in a WordPress installation? We've got a load balancer, right? It, you don't need a load balancer if you only have one server, but once you go beyond one server, you need something to distribute that load among all the servers. So you're going to need a load balancer tier. Now, traditionally, you could use you know, something like uh, HAProxy, or you can even use Nginx to do load balancing, or commercial solutions such as F5. But in AWS, it's really easy to use our load balancing product, which is called Elastic Load Balancing. So Elastic Load Balancing, uh, what that gives you is uh, it's, it's a one-click load balancer. There's almost no management involved, and there's a lot of benefits to that. Then for the app and web tier, we want that to be able to scale up and down automatically in, in response to how much actual demand we have, right? So we're going to use EC2 instances. EC2 is our virtual server service. And we're going to put them in something called an auto-scaling group. So the auto-scaling group, again, allows you to go from, say, two instances to 100 instances as needed, right? And you can define what metrics define scaling up and scaling down. So it could be CPU usage, it could be network out, it could be a custom metrics, like uh, you know, how many uh, Nginx threads I have running, for example. Uh, so you can get really flexible there. And then we're going to have a caching tier. So 
when you have one server, you know, in our earlier architecture, we didn't even bother caching anything. But uh, we're going to use memcached, and we don't want to run our own memcached, so we're going to use Elasticache, which is our managed uh, caching product. And with Elasticache, you can do Redis, which is pretty popular, or memcached. In this case, we're going to do memcached, because there's uh, plugins that you can install for WordPress that make it work with uh, memcached really quickly. And then we're going to break out our database tier. So we have a MySQL database. And so we're going to use RDS. So RDS is the relational database service. And so RDS, what that gets you is redundant uh, multi-availability zone managed databases. Right? And we'll, we'll dive a little bit deeper into that. Another tier that we're going to introduce here is static content. So if something's a JPEG or CSS file uh, or any kind of static content, a PDF, it doesn't need to be on the web server. It's not going to change. The, the web server is not adding any value to it. So we're just going to put it in S3 and have it served straight out of S3. And that's going to give us a bunch of benefits. And lastly, we want our website to be fast. So if my website is hosted in Virginia, and I'm accessing it from Japan, there's going to be some latency involved, right? You can't go faster than the speed of light. So there's going to be some issues there, right? You're not going to have an ideal experience. If you use a content delivery network, when I go to your website, I'm going to actually go to the content delivery network's pop, the one that's closest to me. So I'm going to hit a pop in Japan, and I'm going to have much lower latency to my website. Um, so let's discuss each of the layers that we have and the advantages of them. So elastic load balancing. So with elastic load balancing, you can load balance your traffic to multiple backend instances across availability zones. So what that gives me is now not only do I, can I scale up and down with, with however much capacity I need, I'm also across multiple availability zones. So I'm across multiple data centers. So even if something were to happen to one of the availability zones, my website would stay up. It scales automatically in the background, so I don't have to actually worry about the capacity of my load balancer. It's just there. It's a managed service. And when I get more traffic, it's going to automatically grow. And then it, when I get less traffic, it's going to automatically shrink. And I don't have to do anything to do that. It just happens automatically. And it's integrated with auto scaling. So as I'm using my auto scaling groups to add and remove more instances, uh, they're going to automatically add and remove themselves from the elastic load balancer. So auto scaling, again, allows you to grow and shrink your web and app instances as needed, and it's also auto-healing. So you know, sometimes something can crash on your instance, or something can happen to the underlying hardware that is running your instance, and that shouldn't really matter, right? You should just be able to replace that instance. If you're not using auto-scaling, you have to manually manage it, right? Whereas if you're using auto-scaling, auto-scaling will pick up that your instance is unhealthy, it'll terminate it, it'll launch a new instance automatically. So elastic cache. So the benefit of using memcached um, is that it, it's going to cache your most commonly used SQL queries. So that's going to reduce load on your database. So a database is actually hard to automatically scale up and down, right? a relational database at least. And so you know, typically what we see customers do to scale databases is they'll have read replicas, so they offload the reads from their writes on their database. But a much easier thing to do to start with is just to put memcached in front of it. So memcached, again, is going to is going to cache the most commonly used SQL queries. So when your uh, WordPress is going to you know, try to do a SQL query, it's going to see, oh, is the results of, are the results of this SQL query already in memcached? And if they are, just get it from there. So that's going to reduce load on your database. You can also use memcached for your session store. So if you've got a login on your website, you don't want to keep track of that login on the web servers. Because your web servers are ephemeral. They could grow, they could shrink, so oh, any given web server can disappear at any given time. So what that means is anything that's on the web server, uh, it, it, it sh you shouldn't care about it. So the web server should be completely stateless. And so that means that if you have logs on the web server, you should ship them to a, you know, a different logging server. And you have sessions that you're keeping track of. You should keep track of those sessions in something like memcached. Then we've got RDS. So RDS is, again, our managed database offering. So RDS manages patches and backups for you. So I think patches and back, patching and backing up is really important, but it's also undifferentiated heavy lifting, right? So with RDS, you can just set a schedule for when I want to do backups. So let's say I want to do one backup a day, it'll just do it for me. And then I can restore those backups at any given time, and I can restore it to any point in time within those backups. And I'm going to have multi-AZ. So in RDS, multi-AZ is optional. You don't have to do it. But multi-AZ, again, enables redundancy and enables automatic failover. So your database now, again, lives in two data centers. And if there's a failure of any kind, it can automatically fail over to the other data center. So S3. S3 is our uh, object storage service. Uh, and we're going to use S3 to offload static content. 
So anything that's an image or JavaScript file or CSS file, we're just going to put it in an S3 bucket. And we're going to serve it straight out of that S3 bucket. So S3 can serve things through HTTP or HTTPS. So if you have an encrypted website, you can do that as well. And this will reduce the load on the web servers. So we're going to set it up so that anytime a request comes in for any of the static content, it won't even hit the web server. It'll automatically direct, get directed to your S3 bucket. And S3 is scalable by nature. You don't have to worry about even auto-scaling S3. So it'll just handle the traffic that you throw at it. And lastly, we're going to use CloudFront. So CloudFront is the content delivery network. Uh, we're going to be reducing latency for our users. We're again going to reduce load on our web servers. So CloudFront will cache, aside from the static content, it'll cache anything that it can possibly cache, right? So if you've got a web page that doesn't change, it'll keep a cached version of that web page. So it'll also reduce load off your web servers. Additionally, CloudFront also gives you DDoS protection. So if somebody tries to DDoS you, CloudFront's got a very large footprint and can absorb that DDoS attack for you. So let's take a look at our architecture now. So this is a little bit more complicated, right? And let me walk you through it. So we've got tra this is our website. And so traffic is going to go in, and it's going to hit our CloudFront distribution, right? And our CloudFront distribution is going to say, hey, uh, what kind of content is this? If this content is in wherever the images are, so let's say it's in slash images, it's just going to go directly to the S3 bucket. It's going to cache the content out of the S3 bucket, and it's going to serve it back out to the user. If it's not that, it's going to go to our load balancer. And our load balancer has a set of instances behind it that are running WordPress. So we've combined our app and web tiers here, because uh, you don't really need to break them out with WordPress. And so this could be two servers. This could be 10 servers. This could be 100 servers. It just depends on how much traffic you're going to get. And so we have our servers here. And when we need to go to the database, we're going to have this RDS here. And RDS is going to be um, in a multi-AZ, so there's going to be uh, a two different RDS databases, but they're presented to you as one. So if something happens here, it's going to automatically fail over and re redirect traffic here without your web servers even knowing about it. And then we're going to have a cluster of memcached. So we're going to have at least two memcached servers that are going to be running in our elastic cache service. And so what we have here uh, has several advantages to it, right? We've got no single points of failure. So anything here can fail, right? Everything here, there's more than one of. So if our web server, one of our web servers fails, it's OK. It'll just launch a new one. And there's other capacity to handle the load. Uh, if our, one of our databases fails, it's OK. It'll do a failover. If one of the memcached nodes fails, there's more than one of those. ELB is uh, a, you know, a managed service that automatically heals uh, from failures as well. And so are CloudFront and S3. And so this is what our architecture is going to look like. So just to recap the benefits, uh, there's no single point of failure. We're going to be able to scale up and down as traffic grows and shrinks. And we've broken down our architecture into manageable and scalable components. So sometimes you're going to have more load on your, you know, you're, you're just going to need to have more web servers. Other times, you've got a website that's hitting your database really hard, right? And so that's a database problem. You shouldn't have to scale up your web servers if what you really need to do is change your database. Uh, so it makes it much easier to both figure out where a problem is happening and to resolve that problem if you've broken out your application into different tiers. And lastly, we're going to reduce undifferentiated heavy lifting. So as a DevOps engineer or systems administrator, your time's probably not best spent managing database backups or manually you know, treating servers like Snowflakes uh, or, or setting up memcached. And if you can do that in an automated manner, in a scalable manner, uh, it's, it's going to let you work on more important things that are differentiated, that do make your product better. So that's what I had on uh, running web applications. Let's talk really quickly about, so OK, now you want to run your web application on AWS. How do you gain the skills to do that? Right? So we're going to talk about AWS Educate. Uh, so AWS Educate is our program that helps uh, graduating students get ready for a cloud-enabled workforce. And so when I go uh, to meet with customers, that's what I do in my normal job, I meet with our customers, I, I hear all the time everybody's trying to hire uh, employees with cloud skills. And they're actually really hard to find right now. And so this is the problem that uh, AWS Educate uh, is addressing. So the cloud and AWS specifically have experienced hyper growth as seen by these statistics. Uh, so we're growing rapidly. And it's estimated that the cloud will generate uh, 14 million jobs by 2015. So the jobs are skyrocketing with millions of new jobs being generated. So what's the problem then? That sounds great, right? Well, the problem is that we can't fill the demand for these jobs. 
So there's currently, a, according to McKinsey, a massive skills gap that's only going to get worse. Uh, so McKinsey expects a middle to high skill job gap of 85 million people by 2020. And so why do we care? Well, the education ecosystem needs us to care. So the education ecosystem is feeling the pain and educational ROI is plummeting in higher education and youth unemployment is skyrocketing. So AWS, we're trying to spread cloud evangelists to speed IT innovation and to give the benefits of the cloud to startups, to uh, corporations, government, research organizations, and nonprofits. So we've helped create a program that will that work, it works at scale to, to help students get educated in cloud skills. So we've got a grants program, uh, we've got uh, open course content by leading professors on how to use AWS, uh, we've got labs and training out there on cloud topics and AWS products, and we've got a community to help share best practices virtually and in person. So uh, we've got these four pillars uh, of grants as well. So. Uh, and we're going to be connecting this to jobs as well. So uh, right now, you, you can learn cloud skills. And in, in the future, AWS Educate is going to connect that to how do you get a job out of this. So we already have more than 500 institutions that have joined since we launched in uh, May 2015, um, so uh, all across the world. And if you're interested in joining AWS Educate and getting credits so you can get free AWS credits to get started or to do some kind of project in AWS, you can go to awseducate.com. And uh, whether you're a student, an educator, or edu an educational institution to get started. So that's what I had. So I'm going to stick around for questions here. Uh, thanks, everyone.